Thank you. Thank you, Summer. As Summer said, I'm a professor at UNM, and I write about New Mexico history. Uh, I don't tell the stories that sing our praises. I tell the stories that make us uncomfortable. And in telling New Mexico's history, I've learned two things about history, two challenges that history poses. First has to do with the relationship between the past and the present. The past doesn't determine the present. We're not trapped by our histories. We can make the world what we want of it. But if we don't confront the past courageously, we're bound to be prisoners of our past and the present. And that brings me to the second challenge, which is in order to make the world what we want of it, we have to take off sometimes those rose-colored glasses and look at the past without flinching and confront that honestly. And that's not an easy thing to do in New Mexico, whose colonial origins are found in the violent death of native peoples, whose colonial origins are found in the dispossession of native, native peoples' lands. It's not a hard thing. To, it's not an easy thing to do in New Mexico. How do we reconcile the fact that our lives are made possible for, from native deaths? What about New Mexico's contemporary history? It's organized around the theft of Mexican common property. What does it mean to live in a community built on the destruction of another one? How do we honestly confront that past? We don't always do it so well. It's uncomfortable. We want to ignore it. We want to pretend like the present is unconnected to that painful past of violence. I want to tell you a story. Forty years ago this month, three Navajo men were found murdered, their bodies mutilated beaten in ditches in Farmington, New Mexico. It wasn't an uncommon thing then, and it's not an uncommon thing now. In fact, when their bodies were delivered to the morgue, 60 families called that morgue, asking if their missing relative was one of those dead men. Three white Navajo, I mean, excuse me, three white Farmington teenagers eventually confessed to those murders, and the story that came out was disturbing. It was a blood sport, murdering and mutilating Navajo men. Some of them even cut off the fingers of their victims, and hung them in their lockers to show others. The protests that emerged in the summer of 1974 lasted an entire summer, and the activists who waged those protests call it the long, hot summer. And those Navajo activists and their allies marched in the streets, and they marched to oppose this unspeakable violence, but it wasn't just those three deaths. What made it so troubling and what people were, were frightened to have to confront was the fact that it was a part of everyday life for Navajo men and women in border towns like Gallup and Farmington. But it was easier to just prosecute those three white teenagers than to come to terms with the fact that this colonial pattern of violence wasn't in our history, it was also in our present. What do we do with that? Let's turn our attention to the reason we're here today, which is the problem of police violence in Albuquerque. It's also a longer history. In the 1970s, young Chicano men were dying in our streets in violent conflict with APD at rates the same as now. And radical groups like the Black Berets were joined by mainstream groups like the GI Forum who called it racialized violence. And it was connected to a longer pattern of violence. It was violence against the poor and people of color. But it was too painful to confront. So we pretended like we depicted it as a problem of that one moment not connected to the past. And there had to be us an administrative solution. So there were changes to policies, there was changes to policing, but not to poverty, and people kept dying. Between 1987 and 1997, APD killed 31 people. And those deaths provoked a crisis that led to a report called the Walker Luna Report. That report, like the DOJ report we have now, concluded that most of those shooting deaths were unjustified. But what that report didn't do was connect that history of police violence in that period to older histories of police violence. What that report didn't do was say that the people dying were poor people living in barrios that were experiencing increased militarized policing. It didn't do that. So instead, the solutions that that report suggested, similar to the solutions that the DOJ tells us now, were all around changing APD. They said, we need a police oversight commission, and we need an independent review officer. And the city council did that and made those changes. And in the six years that follow, APD, APD killed 23 more young men. The rate of killing increased actually after we made those changes. So now we find ourselves in another moment of crisis. Now we find ourselves with 24 young people killed since 2010. 
And the DOJ tells us, like the Walker Luna report, that most of those shootings are unjustified, and our police department engages in unconstitutional policing. So we again have two choices. We can do what we've done in the past and pretend like this is just a problem of the present, unconnected to longer histories of violence in our communities. We can pretend like this has nothing to do with the poor or mental illness, that this is just some problem with the police department. Or we can decide, finally, we're going to confront this history head on. We're not going to flinch anymore. We're going to decide to make changes that force us to do the things we don't want to do and have never done before. What would that look like? Well, any of those solutions would have to begin by recognizing that we've created a community where violent conflict between the poor and the police is always only a matter of time. We would have to come to terms with the fact that there are more than 24 victims, and this is older than 2010. We would have to conclude that there is a problem of policing in this community, but there's also structural problems of racism, poverty, and mental illness. We'd have to conclude that we do need better police oversight and better training and higher standards for officers, but those have been the failed solutions of the past because we've never gone beyond that. So what would a solution look like that honestly confronts this past? I think that it's an incredibly painful question to ask, and it's a more complicated answer, and you should be skeptical when people tell you they have solutions. You should, it's not simple, because often we're asking the wrong question. But we should ask, what kind of community do we want to live in? That's where we should start. Do we want to live in a city organized around care, compassion, and community, or one given over to commerce for corporations? Do you want to live in a city organized around restorative justice, or one permeated by pain and prejudice and punishment? It's easy to celebrate the histories that sing our praises. It's much more difficult to courageously confront the stories that don't make us look so good. But it's when we actually and finally confront those histories that we could maybe produce a city that's just for everyone. Thank you.